That was awesome. I love that. I want to do that at the end of the service. I haven't asked for permission, but... Hey, church, um, it's been a great series, and we're talking about joy in the shadows because how many people know that that's when you really need to know the joy of God, when it's when you're in the shadows, and his joy is not an added extra of the Christian life. It's our birthright as the people of God. It's really knowing the life-giving presence of Jesus, that perpetual spring of living water that he said will never dry And this morning I'm speaking about that there is joy in pursuing Jesus Christ. And this morning I'll probably get my preach on. Some of you might feel a little bit like, wow, is he speaking to me? Well, I believe that in the same way that God has been speaking to me in this subject, he's going to speak to you. Um, So why don't we pray and just actually, no, let's read the scripture first and then we'll pray. And uh, we're picking up from the the passage directly after what I preached last week. So the back end of Philippians chapter 3, Paul has spoken about the fact that everything that he used to consider a credential and a gain and a value in his life paled into insignificance compared to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the very things that he used to do to puff himself up with pride were now considered as garbage. Everything I once considered gain, I now consider loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. And so it's not just about knowing about Jesus, it's about knowing him. And it was that treasure of his life that he gave everything for. And he talks about knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection, and um, to know him even in his suffering. And then we pick it up in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this, so all the glory of the resurrection. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. Everyone say, press on. To take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Everyone say, took hold. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of these things. And if on some points you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our bodies so that we will be made like his glorious body. Let's pray. Father, we want your word to empower us this morning. We believe that you desire us to reach out to you, the great, wonderful, holy God of all creation, our wonderful Father who has saved us, our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus, who has redeemed us. And in the same way that you have taken hold of us, God, we want to take hold of your very best for our future. We want to don't just take hold of uh, our future plans and dreams, but we want to take hold of you. We want to pursue the Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you do something in us this morning, that you give us a desire not just to hear from you, not just to be found in you, but to know you more and more, to know your ways, to know your presence, to know your face, to know your kindness, to know your character, and to know the joy that it is to pursue the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I talk about pursuing, I think about running with purpose. You can run. Um, when I, if you go to the gym and you run on a treadmill, you run without purpose because there's nowhere to go. 
And so what do they do? They have screens to distract you so that you can watch the news or the football or soapies to distract you from the fact that you're not going anywhere. I mean, are people going to one day realise this? There's streets and there's roads where you can actually go somewhere and you can see the birds and you can see the sun and it's fantastic. There's a time in my life when, yeah, all the times I run, it's fantastic. Um, You know, I tell my daughter a story about a time when I was pursued and I also pursued. It's the story of uh, when we were... When I was a little boy and we were with our family, we were on a car rally, which is when you get together with other people from you. We had a small church, so we all got in our cars and we had a whole range of clues that we had to get on our adventures. And, and then we had a, a final destination where we had a nice barbecue lunch. And um, it's one of the wonderful things that you can do when you're in a church of 40 people and everyone knows one another. And, but we had an amazing time. And we used to do these car rallies, I reckon, once a year. We, we, were, we headed off our family in our Toyota Turago, my mum, my dad, my brother, my sister, and my grandmother. It was an adventure. And um, there was this long driveway, and the clue was we had to count the number of palm trees on this property. And it was just really out somewhere in the far west of Sydney, um, in the middle of nowhere, really. And we had to walk down this long, long road, and, and behind the tree, behind the property, there was all these trees. And so mum and dad sent me like a lamb being led to the slaughter, down this long path. And they said, Tim, you can go and do it because you're the firstborn, just do it. Um, and I went down and I started, I had my little notepad and I started counting all these trees because that was the clue. And I'm down there and I walked down, I reckon it was probably 200 metres down this long driveway. It was really long. And I'm counting the trees and I just finished and I started just about to turn back and out of the corner of my eye, this is how I tell it to my daughter, I saw two eyes looking at me. They were the eyes of a doberman. And then, out of the corner of my other eye, I saw another Doberman. (laughs) And if you've watched the great um, Academy Award-winning movie, Beethoven, you'll know that Dobermans are the scary dogs that eat people. Um, (laughs) And uh, we just watched that the other day, didn't we? Yes. Um, And Dobermans are scary dogs. Like, they're really scary. Anyway, um, and so all of a sudden, I started running, and I hear my family in the Tarago saying, Tim, run! It's like more dramatic than run for us, run. And I was running so fast, my chubby little legs couldn't go any faster. And you know when you're running so fast that it's like your body and your legs aren't in unison? And I was trying and trying so hard and I was tripping up and I was running and I was running and I was running and I was getting close and they'd open the door of the Trigo so I could just dive in. And as I was just about to get close, the dogs were about to get me. When all of a sudden... There was like, I think it was like a shed or something like that. And the owner of these dogs jumped out in between me and the dogs and like grabbed them and tackled these dogs and whacked them and grabbed them around the collars and saved my life. And I had another 10 metres to go and I dived into that Tarago and my grandmother, she slammed the door shut and there was great singing and rejoicing in the Lockhans household that night. You see, I was being pursued by those dogs. They had a purpose, and it was to bite into my chunky thighs. (laughs) And I had a purpose. It was to survive. There's many times in life where you don't run with purpose. I believe as, um, you know, even I remember another time when I was in school, and I used to, an example of running without purpose is when school gets you to do the cross country. I'm like, what's the go? You're there to learn, not to run and get sweaty and, in my case, get as- have an asthma attack. So I had a meeting with Gregory Yee. He was the slowest runner, um, even slower than me, I thought. Um, and we made a pact that because our results were published on the school wall and, and we thought, let's be equal last and let's just reclaim... Um, our dignity by walking the whole thing. All right, so we walked the whole thing, but what's the purpose? What's the purpose of, of running um, just for this stupid cross country? It's not going to make a difference to my future, you know, anyway. That was my story and I'm sticking to it. Anyway, we walked the whole way and we had 100 metres to go and Gregory Yee, who is still my Facebook friend that I might unfriend him after this, he said, Tim, what's that over there? And I looked And then he bolted. Gregory Yee bolted. 
And he, um, he got a 10 metre head start and then he beat me. I thought 10, I could get 10 metres on him, but I couldn't. And yeah, it wasn't great. You see, there's a massive difference in running with purpose and running and, running and walking without purpose. And I believe that there is a joy in, ha- in purposely pursuing Jesus. Purposely pursuing the Lord Jesus. Why don't we as Western Christians and even people in this church and even myself, why don't I pursue Jesus? I think the most basic reason why we don't is because we don't think we need to. Because we have such a high value on the finished work of Jesus, the complete work of salvation, that by his blood we are forgiven, we are free, we are redeemed, that nothing you can do will make God love you more or less, that we don't have to climb up to achieve God's favour, that we can enter into God's throne of grace with confidence at any time. That in Paul, in Ephesians, says that we are in Christ, our most fundamental identity, that when God looks at you, he doesn't look at what you do or what you pursue. He looks at who covers you and he sees the Lord Jesus and he says, you are in Christ. You are my child. So your most fundamental identity is a child of God. And that is amazing. But it doesn't stop there. And I think so many of us, we think that the joy of the Lord, that that pursuing Jesus is not necessary because we already have Jesus, which is true. But we don't think that we need to pursue him, his heart, his face, his ways. Because the goal of the Christian life is not just to get saved, but it's to be conformed to the image of Jesus. It's to be a man or woman that becomes fully human, that actually takes your place as God to to actually become the person God made you to be so that you can see his kingdom, his future kingdom, which is already breaking in, break out in earth through your life. But you see, the kingdom of God, if we read in the New Testament, the kingdom of God is now. Absolutely now. It's not just a futuristic kingdom. That It's not like the kingdom of God is going to come when Jesus returns. The kingdom of God is now. When Jesus first arrived in his ministry, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist, same thing. The kingdom of God is at hand. That where Jesus is, there is the king and he is reigning and he is ruling. In Colossians chapter 2, we see that on the cross, he has claimed victory and he has paraded his victory over the enemy. And he has disarmed the powers of the evil one. And so in a very real sense, we have this sense that the kingdom of God is at hand and the reign and rule of Jesus is now. Now. Who's the king of the world? Jesus. Now. But there's also an aspect, when we read through the New Testament, that there's, there's a now aspect of the kingdom of God, but there's also a not yet. You have not yet got your resurrected body. Your body is perishable. There's aspects of our life that won't fully be received until the consummation when Jesus wraps all the things up and when Jesus returns and makes all things new. And I've had this revelation just in the last few weeks and you might want to write this down because it caused me a lot of praying and a lot of reflection and a lot of pain to get this but you might not think it's that profound. It says this, don't confuse your position in Christ with your posture towards him. Don't confuse your position in Christ with your posture towards him because thank God we have a position in Christ that will never change. We are children of God. We are at his right hand. Jeez, we are with Jesus in the heavenly realms that our future is secure. But we can change our posture towards him. How many people know that it is possible to turn your back on God? We've all done it. And so God is right there. We are in him, but we can turn our back. We can change our posture of our life towards him and we become less joyful, less effective, less in love with him and less in love with the things he loves. Or we can have a posture of desperation. We can have a posture of openness. We can have a posture of running towards him. You see, there's a time for everything in the Christian life. I do believe that. I believe that for some of you, there is a time to sit and rest. You might want to look up Psalm 46 or Psalm 132. It talks about just the need to rest in God. It talks about the need to be still in God. And for some of you, you're going through grief. You're going through physical or emotional exhaustion. There is a time just to dwell in the presence of the Lord and allow him to minister to you. 
There is a time for that. And just to allow his spirit and his kindness and his grace and his faithful words to wash over you. And just to be okay with being a child of God, not doing anything. It's okay just to sit. But very rarely are we called to stay in that sitting position. The Bible also talks about a time to stand. Sometimes we might not be making a lot of movement. Sometimes we might not be doing much, but we need to stand because in Ephesians 6, it says that there is a spiritual battle going on and we need to put on the armor of God so that we may stand and take hold our ground against the enemy that would push against us. But there's also a time to run. And I want to suggest that the the normal Christian life should be a life of movement and pursuit. It shouldn't be one of sitting and it shouldn't be just one of standing. It should be one of running the race because Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, he talks about running the race with purpose. He says, I don't run just aimlessly. I'm not like a boxer that just punches the air. I box with precision. I box with purpose. And that's 1 Corinthians 9. And so you are called to live in such a way that you pursue God with purpose. Because imagine if you got married and you got the wedding ring on your finger and then you said, I'm married, I'll be married till death do us part. The, the, the state says so, God says so, and that's a done deal, but I don't want to have a relationship with you anymore and I don't want to get to know you more. ba boom. Imagine if that was your heart. Imagine if you were adopted by some wonderful parents and these parents said, you are our child now. You can have all the riches of our pantry. You can have all of our inheritance. And then the kid says, thanks for that. And then never wants to spend time with the parents. I suspect sometimes that's what we're like with God. Thank you for the finished work of your salvation, but I'm not seeking you any longer. The great... um, writer A.W. Tozer wrote this and it was like a dagger to my heart 1948 the pursuit of God how tragic that we in this dark day have had our seeking done for us by other people everything is made to center upon the initial act of accepting Christ and we are not expecting thereafter to crave any further revelation of God in our souls We have been snared by the coils of a spurless logic, which inserts that if we have found him, we no longer need to seek him. You know, I believe that when Paul said, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5.18, he was actually saying that the things of this world that distract us from the eternal things, the things that this world that give us happiness and temporal joy, I have something greater. You don't need to numb your pain. You don't need to escape this world. You don't need something to enhance your happiness and your joy in a temporal sense. Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit in an ongoing sense. And Paul is saying that we need to become God-aholics. The Spirit is not deadening. He doesn't make us more dull. He makes us more alive. He is addicting. And the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit is that you want to know him more in your life and you want to give him more access to all realms of your life. And the sign of having God's grace in your life is that you want to discover his grace more and more because we have walked into the kiddies pool of grace, but there's a whole ocean that we can dive into and understand how great and how wide and how deep is the love of God in Christ Jesus. Can I hear an amen? Amen. So why do we need to pursue him? Well, the Word of God in that passage we looked at in Philippians chapter 3 has some great tools about why we need to pursue Him and how we can pursue Him. So the first thing I want to say about why we need to pursue Him is that we need to pursue Him to get to know Him more, not for stuff, not to make our life better. We just need to know Him more. Philippians 3.10, the scripture we looked at last week says, I want to know Christ to know the power of his resurrection and participation of his sufferings. He's saying, all of my life, I want to know Christ. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of victory, I want to know Christ. This is after already receiving Christ. I wonder if someone asks you, what is the desire of your heart? What is the pursuit of your life? What if your answer was, I want to know Jesus more because I can't wait to see him. And the more time I spend with him, the more I become like him to get to know him more. 
The second reason why we need to pursue him is because we are far away from our goal. I think some of us feel like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I do the bare minimum. I, you know, I don't swear anymore and I'm pretty generous with my money and I did Bible discovery back in 1993. So, yeah, I've reached, I've, I've ticked all the boxes of being a good Christian and that's cool. Paul says in Philippians 3.12, not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal. You see, I believe that God wants to build a dissatisfaction into our hearts this morning. I also believe that you need to be fully satisfied with the man and woman that God created you to be. I believe everyone in this room, God wants you to be the person that looks in the mirror and say, I'm happy being who I am and I don't want to be anyone else. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I am so proud of who God made me to be. God has given me gifts and talents, and if I compare myself to others, I'm, gonna com- I'm, I'm not going to be able to do some things that they can do, but I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God has put purpose in my heart, and I am happy with who I am. I think that's fine, and that's great, and we need that. We need to be satisfied with our gifts and talents and our calling. We need to be content. Godliness with contentment, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6 is great gain. But we need to become satisfied with, we need to be satisfied with so many things in our life that are about us that we become dissatisfied with work, friends, relationships. And we spend all of our life being dissatisfied with those things. God says, I want you to be satisfied with those things and I want you to stop asking for more. But I want you to be dissatisfied with your spiritual life. Because when you read the Bible, We don't just come to the Bible and read it and examine it as the authority figures. When we open the Word of God and we read the teachings of Jesus, we read the teachings of Peter and Paul, when we read the prophets, what happens is God the Holy Spirit reads our hearts. When you read the Word of God, it's like looking in the mirror and the mirror looks back at you and you realize, wow, I've got some envy in my heart. I've got some selfishness in my heart. I've got some areas that still aren't looking a lot like Jesus. And so what happens is we become satisfied with our spiritual life. And God is saying, I love you. Nothing you can do will make me change my love for you. But I want you to become more like me because you're only living in a shadow of the fullness of what I have for you. You see, we need to become dissatisfied with our spiritual life. Not wallowing in shame and guilt, just saying, God, I want to grow. God, I want your Holy Spirit to have control of every aspect of my life. Not to beat ourselves up, but it's the desire. What are the desires of your heart? The third reason that we need to pursue him is that because God has already pursued us. Philippians 3.12 says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. The best explanation of this is that is that passage in Philippians 2, just the chapter earlier where it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act in accordance to, to fulfill his good purpose. You see, we pursue God, we take hold of Jesus Because he's taken hold of us. It's such a beautiful picture. What has Jesus done in your life? He chose you before you chose him. He picked you. He called you. He took you to be his own. He made you his. And because you are his, you now have the privilege and the freedom to choose him back. You have the privilege and the freedom and and you are free from the shackles to say, God, I choose you and I want to be with you and I want to be near you. We pursue God because he's already pursued us. And this fear and trembling, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. What it means is that because we are already saved by God's grace through faith because of the finished work of Jesus, he's already at work in us. And now what we get to do is we get to cooperate with his Holy Spirit to work out what a saved life should look like. And so there's a cooperation and we pursue God because he's already pursued us. The most fundamental reason why you go hard after the Lord Jesus is that Christ is in you, moving you to pursue him with all you have. So how can you do it? Paul says, but one thing I do. Everyone say one thing. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. 
Forget the things from your past that would hinder you from seeking him. The point is not never look back. The point is only look back for the sake of pressing forward. Never allow nostalgia or the good old days to substitute the glorious hope that we have in the future because Jesus is king and he is making this world a kingdom in every aspect. His kingdom is breaking in and it will one day be fulfilled. Memories of The problem with looking in the past is memories of successes can make you smug or self-satisfied. You know, in my own life, sometimes if I'm preparing a sermon, I think, oh, what, what would be a good story for the, to illustrate this point? And some of my stories, a lot of my stories might be from 10, 12, 15 years ago. And I've often felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Tim, isn't it a shame that you don't have a story to tell about this? about a great act of generosity, about a great act of sacrifice, about a great uh, thing that God did through you in reaching someone and leading them to the Lord Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if you had a story from 10 days ago, not 10 years ago? Because what can happen, even in religious people, particularly preachers, is that we tap ourselves on the shoulder for past achievements and we become smug and we don't become hungry for a fresh move of God. We don't acknowledge our need for him to consistently move tomorrow and the day after that. And so for some of you, your greatest successes in ministry and the time where you felt closest with God is in your past and it should not be the case. You see, we should grow in maturity and our love for God. But also there's memories of failure. And memories of failure can make you feel hopeless and paralyzed in your pursuit of God. Amen. Don't look back on those things. Forget those things in the same way that God chooses to forget them. Forget those things. Don't allow them to shape the hope of God in your life. Give humble thanks for your successes and make humble confessions for your failure. Then turn to your future and pursue God with all you have. How can we pursue him? Forget the things from the past. Secondly, we strain forward. Everyone say strain. Let's have a look at this scripture. And straining towards what is ahead. Isn't that a horrible word, straining? In all the five times I've been to the gym, if you saw my face when I'm trying to lift something that's too heavy for me, there's this look. It's kind of like a a very non-pretty look. Um, And there's something about our lives that why would you strain if you could live life without straining? Doesn't that make sense? Well, Paul, the most secure man in the New Testament outside of Jesus, he's so sure about who he is in Jesus, but he's saying, I'm straining towards what ahead. I press on. Everyone say, press on. Towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You see, when I was a young Christian, I was so hungry for God. I remember my friend gave me a cassette. And um, some of you, if you don't know what a cassette is, you can Google that and find out what a cassette is. And I put the, that got no laughs in the early service because everyone, everyone knew what a cassette was. Isn't that funny? Um, lol. Um, okay, so my friend gave me, I was 18, she gave me a she gave me, wow, the rain just stopped. Hallelujah. That was getting really distracting. Gave me a cassette on fasting. I had never ever, like fasting was one of those things that I only read about in the Bible. And I thought, it's just one of those weird things that we don't do today, like foot washing, which the kids in our kids' church did two weeks ago. Praise the Lord. And, and, um, and, and I listened to this tape and I was so filled with wonder saying, God, if there's a discipline I can engage in that helps me to grow closer to you and helps me to become more attuned to your spirit and helps me to become less someone that just feeds my flesh and becomes more aware of my need physically and emotionally and spiritually for you. I want to do it. And if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And so I, I used to fast. I just, just, as soon as I watched the tape, the next day I started fasting. And I was the guy that never missed a meal and I just fasted for a day and then I broke the fast by ordering a large pizza and I ate the whole thing. Praise the Lord. That's not the way to break a fast. Um, One day we'll do a teaching on fasting, and that's top of the list of what not to do when you break a fast, Um, even a one-day fast. Anyway, but 
But whether it was fasting or whether it was um, doing a course, I remember there was a, a, a Contagious Christianity course and I said, I'm hopeless at sharing my faith with others. I want to know more. And so I did the course and then I went out there and I tried to use it in my workplace and I failed miserably. But you know what? I had a heart to serve God. I had a heart to be used by him in the midst of making mistakes, in the midst of pursuing his heart. God showed me a lot and I actually got more effective in witnessing to people from different worldviews and different walks of life. For some of you, it might just be taking that leadership challenge because I believe that for us to strain, we have to make a commitment to do something that might cost us in the short term. You can't strain without some pain. You can't strain just by relaxing. And so if you're going to run forward, anyone that's seen, uh, you know, like those runners, I mean, what about those 10,000 metres runners in the last lap? They're sprinting. I'm just thinking, shoot me now. Like, I just, I can't run that fast for 50 metres. It's amazing. Strain forward. So how can we pursue him? By forgetting the things in the past and straining forward. Make a commitment to do something that might cost you in the short term. Do a course. Engage in a spiritual discipline. Reach out to him. Re-engage your worship life. Re-engage your prayer life. Do something. You see, I've had a big revelation in recent times that true spiritual maturity doesn't just look like a wise old person sitting in a chair knowing all the answers. True spiritual maturity looks like Jesus. And spiritual maturity and the enjoyment and the full joy of the Lord rely on both security in who we are in the Lord Jesus and also spiritual intensity. And I've often confused spiritual intensity with trying to seek God's favour. But the truth is, if we already have security in who we are, then we will want to be intense in our pursuit of God and His purposes in our life. Pastor Phil Pringle, one of the greatest church leaders of our generation, just recently at a conference said this. He said, he was asked, what's the greatest need for Christian leaders today? And he said, the greatest need is for Christian leaders to be secure in who they are. Secure in their place in Jesus and secure in their leadership. Because left, right and centre, you see people trying to win favour and trying to establish themselves. But if you're secure, you can actually pursue Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he was on this earth, was the most secure man that ever lived. But he spent more time than you and I pursuing the Father. Spiritual maturity and enjoyment rely on both security and spiritual intensity. Oh, sorry, I forgot to read the scripture. Philippians 3.15. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of these things. Isn't that interesting? He's saying this worldview that I'm playing out of pursuing God that pursued us, this is how mature people should think. Not that we've got it finished. Not that we're sinless and we're perfect. Not that we just get to sit back and relax. This is what a mature woman or man would look like. I also believe that um, in the next passage, it shows us that we need spiritual role models to follow in our pursuit of Jesus. And um, let's just look at the scripture together. It says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before and now tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. You see, Paul is saying, use me as a spiritual role model. And I think most of us would be too shy to say that. We'd say, don't follow me. I'm sinless and I'm imperfect. Just follow Jesus. But following Jesus through the Bible is not enough because what you and I do is we conform Jesus to our own image. Or we read over the bits of the Bible we don't like. But there's something about having people in your world that are a little bit further along the journey and actually following and learning from them how they don't just stay still, how they don't just know all the answers, but how they pursue Jesus in their life. Just this week, um, my wife Nikki and I had our great friends and people we look up to so much, Janet and Phil Bryce, come over to our house. And we just said, guys, we just feel like we'd love you to pray with us over some things, some things that God's been speaking to us about in our family. And it's just such a blessing to have people a little bit further along the journey, but they don't just sit there and they say, well, we know everything and thus saith the Lord. They are men and 
Janet and Phil are a man and woman that are pursuing the heart of God and they are growing and growing and growing and slowly being conformed into the image of Jesus. And I am so thankful that I have spiritual role models like that. I'm so thankful for people like Lockie and Stacey Donaldson, who I would consider two of the most mature Christians in this church, and they're in their 20s. And I watch them on a Sunday night up from this stage, and I see them, like, just moving across. And they'll, they'll move from one side of the auditorium to the other, take people aside and pray with them. Whenever they come to church, I know for a fact, they say, God, put on my heart someone that I can encourage and bless today. That's what spiritual maturity is. And you know what I love about that? I've seen that, that um, Esther Lane, she's probably, not, I'm embarrassing people here, but I'm committed. She's, she's on holiday. She's on her second honeymoon. Um, Esther Lane, I watch her now, and she has picked up the spirit of Lockie and Stacey. So I don't mean that in a weird way. I mean something of their spirit and their heart and their pursuit of God and following him and blessing people has rubbed off on her, and now she is imitating Jesus by loving people and caring for people and encouraging people. We need spiritual role models. And then finally, we need a saviour. Can I have everyone stand to their feet? And I want to invite the band up to the stage.